Uh, let me say, let me say this. Um, tonight is Matthew's last service at Fairhavens for a while. He, mom, and dad, they're all going to be with me next Sunday, but they won't be here. I'll be over at Bellwood next Sunday. So if you want to leave Brother Mike high and dry, I don't blame you. I'm not kidding. But he's gonna. But he's going to Arizona next Wednesday. They're going to start heading down to Arizona uh, for Mom's new job and whatnot. And so y'all pray for them. Make sure you go say uh, your final goodbye to Matthew for a little bit. You know, I've had at least three or four people uh, come up to me at once, and they told me they said, uh, "Brother Silas, you could you could run everything up there. You could lead music. You could play piano. You could preach, and all that." And I said, "Yeah." But, uh, you know, I'm just the face of the thing. What really goes on, the real work is what takes, in the background, takes place in the background. You don't see the people who do that. And that's Matthew. That's Matthew. If, if there's something that needs to be cleaned, if there's something that needs to be moved, if, there, if Mike's needs setting, there's, there's, if there's any kind of project, Matthew's on top of it. So y'all make sure y'all, y'all, y'all love on Matthew a little bit before he, before he leaves tonight. And... Uh, Make sure you tell him thank you, and thank you for everything. Matthew's done pretty good. Um, take your Bibles to Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16. And uh, we're going to look at an interesting subject this evening that often gets overlooked. Oftentimes this, this subject, we don't, it doesn't cross our mind very often. It, um, it allures us almost, eludes us. Whenever something takes place, we don't ever think about this. This is not your first thought. This is a second thought. This is an afterthought. What we're going to look at is practiced very little in most churches, in most churches, practiced very little. And I hope that tonight we would make it a common practice around Fair Havens. Tonight, this subject we're going to look at, I hope that we take it and that we use it whenever, whenever we can, whenever we can. And look with me at verse number 9, Luke chapter 16, verse number 9. The Bible says this, And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that, get, this, get these three words here, when ye fail, they may receive you, into everlasting habitations. That when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you so much for the day. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Lord, thank you for uh, the beautiful day we had. I pray that you help us in this message. Help, help me as I preach. Give me the words to say. Help me to speak clearly and with authority, Lord. I pray that you help me not to say anything I shouldn't. We love you, Father. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. This subject, you, know, you say we're talking about failure. Well, not completely. Not completely. I want to talk to you this evening about restoration. Restoration. Uh, let me make a few statements and we'll get right into it. Number one, we will fail. Luke 16, verse 9, Jesus' words, when ye fail. He didn't say if you fail. He didn't say if you happen to fail or if some other fail. No, he said when. When, which means it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Peter didn't believe that. Y'all remember Jesus told them that he was, they were all going to forsake him when they were coming to get him. And Peter said, I'll never forsake you, Lord. And he says, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to, you're going to curse me, Peter. What are you talking about? No, Lord, I would never let you down. Hey, don't we get like that sometimes? <laughs> no, I'll never let God down. I'll never stop doing that, or I'll never quit doing this, or I'm going to start doing this. No, no, no. When ye fail, it's, 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 it's just going to happen. It's just going to happen. The Bible says that we're prone to sin. Now, before I go any further than this, I'm not making excuses for sin this evening. Okay, we're not excusing, ex, ex, excusing sin. Okay, we're going to get to that in just a minute. But it says we're prone to sin. Uh, it is Bible study this evening, so turn to Romans chapter 7. 
Romans chapter 7. I want you to see this for yourself. Romans 7, verse number 15. Listen to what Paul's saying. He says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that it is good. Now when it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 18, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not, for the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members, get this now, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. A wretched man that I am, and who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There's spiritual warfare taking place on the inside. I'm not, I'm not teaching y'all anything new. Everybody knows this, right? A spiritual warfare, a constant struggle, it, it, it's, it's almost aggravating most of the time. But we're prone to sin. See, when we were lost, we didn't think twice about sin. But when we got saved, now we, we, now we have to take a second thought at it. Because it, 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 it's sad that we have to take a second thought at it, but naturally we, we just sin. A creature's a habit. I'm not making excuses for sin. But when you sin, what happens? What do you do about that? Uh, a constant battle, a constant struggle, warring one against another. There are easy sins, sins we find easy to do. Uh, Hebrews 12.1 says to lay aside the weight in every sin that so easily besets us. In Hebrews 12.1. And there's some things that we, we, we do without thinking about it that we may not know is wrong. There are some things that we can slip into very easily and not even, not even, not even think about it, not even consider it. Easy sins, sins that, that we may practice a little bit every day until, until one day that sin gets bigger and the next day the sin gets bigger before that and the next day the sin gets bigger before that and then eventually you just fall. And you fail. But what happens then? What happens when a brother gets overtaken in a fault? Now, before I go any further, we are not excusing sin. Um, if we find out tomorrow that you went out and murdered somebody, we will turn you into the authorities, okay? That we're not using this as an excuse to get away with sin, okay? There, I'm not saying that consequences will go away. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that, that no judgment will be levied against you. I'm not saying that. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Here's what I am saying, though, is that when you sin, is it over for you? Are you done? What happens after you sin? What happens after you fall? After the, that fault, to have a fault is to lack something. It's a weakness or an area you, you're failing often. Something, a struggle almost. A struggle. What happens when you when you when this fault when this struggle when this sin that is so easy to you consumes you you give in to it for instance i said this at at, at one church if 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 a pedophile came in here what would we do he said well we kick him out well wait a minute now in the church for sinners didn't Jesus' blood cover all sin? That's a hard topic. My flesh said, let's strangle the guy. 
I'll get one side, Brother Ribbon, you get the other side, we'll get him. So now, wait a minute. No, we're not going to put him in the kids' ministry. No, but what do we do? What if an adulteress comes in here? Then what? Well, we got to we got to church discipline them, especially if they was a Christian. If there's a church member, we got it. We got to kick them out. What's the Bible say? To to have no fellowship or company with them. What about someone who's just who's, who's a wolf? And they're just seeking to split the church. What do you do with that? Well, there is a route. Now, I understand there are some cases where where the church discipline. And where you do have to separate that member to say, look, you know, this has gone on too far. But there is a route that we often skate over. What about restoring the person? Because when you fail, and you will fail, I don't want to be cast out. What about restoring the person? Look with me, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul's talking to the people at Galatia. He said this, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and he gives in these next few lines a recipe for restoring this person. Let me start with the first one. Number one, he said, ye which are spiritual, which are spiritual. Uh, Not everybody can, can, can restore someone, okay? If you're struggling with your Bible reading, if you're struggling with your prayer, if you're struggling walking with the Lord, and you don't have to go tell everybody you're struggling with it, but don't try to go help somebody else out of their sin, out of their mistake. Ye which are spiritual, those who study the Scripture, those who walk with God every day, who consistently uh, talk to Him through prayer, you ought to be the first ones to go up and see if this, this uh, man or woman would like to get right with God. You ought to be the first ones. Uh, Sunday school teachers, the pastor, the assistant pastor, the deacons. I mean, if you're walking consistently with the Savior, the person, the, the brother, you ought to see if he wants to be restored first before casting them out. You know, we, we, we wouldn't cast our physical family members out when they mess up, we forgive them. But then when one of our, one of our spiritual family members, one of our church family members mess up, it's like, a, it's like a, a, a shark when he smells blood in the water. Also, all the sharks go after wherever the blood's at. Isn't that sad? Man, one person slips, and we kick him while he's down. When the spiritual should be trying to lift them back up. You say, well, you, you don't know what they did, Brother Silas. I, I, and I don't care what they did. I got the Bible that says that Jesus' blood covered every sin. I got the Bible that says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. When Jesus came down, he didn't hang out with the Pharisees. He hang out with the publicans and with the sinners and with the sick. Those who could do nothing for him. Those were the people, the ones that needed a physician, that needed the help the most. He didn't kick them while they were down. He didn't place a law book over their head. No, what did he do? He went and gave them the gospel. He went and told them uh, that woman that came was brought to him, taken in the act of adultery. After all her, all her accusers left, he said, Woman, where are thine accusers? And she said, They left. He said, Well, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. When he met that woman at the well, at the well, <laughs> he didn't bring up her sinful lifestyle right off the bat. Oh, you wicked sinner. I know everything about you. What did he do? But he started talking to her. And he dealt with her sin. But what was his whole goal? Why did he have to go through Samaria? It was to save that woman. 
And it's amazing to me that when a, when a, when a brother or a sister in Christ, they're saved. Their blood bucked. They are, uh, were trying to serve God and they just happen to slip on a banana peel and we'll go and we'll stomp him to death. Well, why do uh, young people, they don't want to go to church. Why do people, they, they, get, they get so bitter at the church. I'll tell you why. Part of the reason is because the church won't forget some of the sin they did. I'm not saying be foolish. We're not, listen, we're not going to let a murderer hang around by himself with someone else by themselves. Lest we start finding people missing. Okay, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not going to let a pedophile go in the children's ministry. We're not going to let, we're not going to let a, a, a thief run the finances. Okay, we're not putting open temptations in front of you. But good night. At some point, you got to move past whatever that person done. At some point, you got to look at it how God looks at it. The Bible says that when you got saved, when you accepted Christ, and then when you sinned again, He said, if you confess your sins, I will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And in Hebrews he said, I will remember their sins no more. See, when somebody wants to get right with God, they don't need your help beating themselves up. They beat themselves up. The reason they want to get right with God is because they recognize they're wrong. The reason they want to get restored is because they recognize the mistake they made. They don't need my help putting them down. They do that plenty enough on their own. The spiritual. Somebody makes a mistake and they better get on top of it and see if they want to get restored. They ought to see if they can pull them out of the snare of the devil as quick as they can instead of tightening the snare. You understand what I'm saying? Is this making sense? Talking about uh, restoring somebody it ought to be the spiritual that restore them. And by the way, this restoration isn't just uh, restoring them spiritually. This is restoring them back into service too. Okay, there's plenty of jobs around the church. There's plenty of jobs that a Christian can do. In spite of the things that, well, you, Brother Sash, you don't know the lifestyle I lived. I, I, I couldn't help the church. Wait a minute now. Okay. There is nothing that can exclude you from helping keep the building clean. There's nothing that will exclude you from uh, giving someone else the gospel. There's nothing that will exclude you from doing something for God. Oftentimes, if it, when people don't do it, it's because the person who knows about their sin won't let them do anything for the Lord. Well, you don't know what they do. That may not be the best person for the job, Pastor. See, but if you restored them and they came back to God willingly, then you ought to let God decide what they do. Um, how how they ought to be restored. They ought to be restored gently. The Bible says, and restore uh, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. We talked about that just a little bit. Uh, meekness is mild. It's gentle. It's moderate. Meekness is not weakness. If you think that, read the story of Moses. I, I can, listen, I can take a stick and I can go outside and hit as many rocks as I want. I'm not going to split any of those rocks in half. Moses took his staff, split a rock in two. Hey, man, look at, look at, he, he was a strong leader. When Korah came up to rebel against Moses to the people of Israel, he wanted to overthrow uh, those who were put in charge. Moses said, fine, let's see some new thing. Let's see what God can do with this. And earth, earth opened up, swallowed up all the people, and then closed right back together. I have never seen a sinkhole closed. Oh, well, that one did. 
But the Bible describes Moses as the meekest man. The meekest man. I said it a few minutes ago. Um, going around smacking people over with a rule book isn't the way to go about it. Now, we do have rules. I'm not, listen to it, I'm not casting out the rules. There's a fine line. I think some churches, they either bend too far to one side uh, where, they, where they claim, well, well, because of grace, we can do all this sin, or they lean too far to the other side. Uh, if you're not walking stiff-legged and real slow, then you're in the wrong. You understand what I'm saying? You, 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 don't, you don't need to be doing it that way. It's not a, it's not a rush either. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 that we, we're not supposed to compare ourselves among ourselves. And sometimes I think that when we're trying to help somebody as a, as a Sunday school teacher, we're trying to, to rush this person up to where we're at. We're trying to, to, to give this guy a quick, swift, ki uh, swift kick in the butt to get on the move. When what they need is, is a loving brother, a loving sister, just as God, as our Father would, to gently help you along. You don't help a toddler to walk by kicking their legs out from underneath them. It would be funny, though. But you don't. I have a warped sense of humor. <laughs> don't point me. Gentle. Being gentle. And what do you, what, what do you have to go around bad, uh, bad mouthing somebody all the time? putting somebody down on time because they did something stupid 15 years ago. They give it up. Let it go. I think sometimes God's people hold grudges more than the devil does. It's time we start restoring some fallen Christians in the spirit of meekness. Gently, kindly. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a time that you need to pull out a belt. My, my, my father was really good at this. The Bible says that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. My father loved me real well. Okay? But it wasn't over every single wrong that I got, I got a beating. I can remember one time I... I, I, I I mouthed off, I said something, and my dad took me into our, our den. He sat me down, and he said, son, read this book, and he gave me uh, the Bible, and he had opened it to the book of John, and it brought me to tears. Hey, I was 11 years old. Hey, sometimes it's not a belt that you need. I'm not saying get rid of the belt either. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Is this making sense this evening? Sometimes my own preaching doesn't make sense to me, so I need feedback from the congregation. That's why saying amen is so good for the preacher, because then he knows I wasn't daydreaming last night. <laughs> Gently. But notice this. The Bible says in this last, this last part of it, in verse 1, considering thyself, lest thou also... Be tempted. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians for a moment. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Two verses to look at. Verse 12 and verse 13. Verse 12 says this, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Verse 12 again. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Uh, there's a warning that comes with restoration. For any of you in here who think, well, I, I, I walk with God pretty good. I pray pretty good. I read my Bible pretty good every day. I study the Word of God. I try to live it out the best I can. 
be very careful when you go to help somebody. They need help, but you've got to watch your step. Well, Brother Silas, I'll never commit that sin. Don't ever say that. Wherefore, uh, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You're just as capable of committing the, the worst, the grossest, the, the nastiest sin there is as the next guy. Your flesh is still your flesh. Let's not think we're so high and mighty that we can't stoop as low as the scum of the earth. I could stand here today and I, I, I could uh, finish preaching this message to you and then tomorrow go out and do something horrendous. And you can too. Don't think that we're immune to sin or to certain sins. Well, I'll never drink. You don't know. Well, but, but besides, I'll, I'll never do that or I'll never go here or there. Listen, you don't know. And when you're helping somebody else, you may get entangled in the same web of sin that they're entangled in. You've got to be very careful. Very careful. We want them to come back, don't you? Life isn't over just because a, a teenager or a young man takes a look at pornography. That's sin, yeah, it's wrong, but life's not over. They're not dead yet. Why do we treat them like they're dead? Life's not over when someone goes to prison. I'm not justifying sin, but I, I, I'm so tired of seeing us give up because someone does something stupid. And if, if you knew everything I've done, y'all probably wouldn't let me in the doors. And don't, listen, don't think that it wouldn't be the same for you. I'm sure if we knew everything pastor done, we might not want him to be pastor. Y'all wouldn't let me be Sunday school teacher. Hey, let, let's be honest real fast this evening. We're very susceptible to the same sin that they did and got to be careful. You got to watch your back. You got you to watch very careful. You got to make sure. That's why the Bible says uh, that if you, you have a wrong with somebody, that you go up to them first and try to get it right, and then you bring a second person, and then you take it before the church. Why? Right, because it's accountability. It's being careful. It's watching your step. Restoring somebody. Restoring them carefully. Uh, the spiritual restoring them. Restoring them gently. Don't even try to restore them. If you, be real honest with yourself. If you're not uh, walking with the Lord as you should, don't, don't try to dabble in that mess. Leave it alone. Get yourself right. I'm not saying perfect. I'm saying right with the Lord. And then try to help them. And then try to help them. I wonder what the Lord might do when we try to do that. There was a, a, a lady. She had a... There was a church, excuse me. There was a church who had a 16-year-old girl walking around pregnant in that church. And the pastor came up and was trying to help this girl. And, the, and this woman comes up to him and said, Pastor, that's a bad example. We can't have that around here. You got to kick that out. Church discipline or pastor, you can't, you can't look like that. Sin's okay. And he says, I understand, but I, I want to see if she wants to get right with the Lord first. And she said, no, no. And she kept on and on until a few weeks later. They found out who got that girl pregnant. It was her 17-year-old son. She came up to pastor and she said, now, pastor, please don't, don't, don't kick my son out. Don't make him leave. Would you please talk to him, see if he wants to get right? He's like, oh. See, it's a little bit different when family's involved. And I, I got something to say. Pastor said it this last Sunday. 
we're family in here. I don't want to see you go. <laughs> I hope you don't want to see me go. Let me ask you something. Here's, here's the challenge, and then we'll, we'll do the prayer. If somebody were to fall, if somebody was to commit an outrageous sin, would you be able to help them come back to the Lord when you get untangled? Listen, once you fall into a, into a deep sin, doubts rise up. You feel like you can't get out. It's almost as if you shut a cage in on yourself with a lion. Would you have the capability to help pull them out? Be honest with yourself now. Some of you in here, you, maybe, maybe there is a fault that's overtaking you. I'm not big on confessing your sins to men. I have one high priest. That's Jesus Christ. I'll confess my sins to him. But there are struggles and there are temptations that, that you may need a second opinion on. Why wait till you're drowning to ask for a lifeboat? To call the Coast Guard? Let's pray and we'll get into our prayer list. Father, thank you so much for this evening. Lord, I pray that you help us Father, before we, before we go to the extremes of discipline, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to re try to restore a fallen brother. Help us try to restore that lost church member. Lord, that, that saved brother or saved sister who may have slipped on their way, Father, you don't leave us behind. I pray that you'd help us not to leave them behind. Thank you for being so good to us. Help us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Has anybody got a prayer sheet? This is, this is why Pastor Miss Sherry can never take vacation.